Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Product School webinar. Today, we'll be talking about how to measure product manager impact. My name is Josh Palma, and I am a principal PM lead at Microsoft. I work in the Microsoft Azure division. More specifically, I'm a product lead in Azure Kubernetes Service, one of our most popular cloud-based products. You might notice the image in the slide is not a strange shot from the Golden Gate Bridge. It's actually a famous bridge in Lisbon, Portugal. I am originally from Portugal, as you can also see in the picture behind me. Uh, and I have a background in computer engineering. I've done different roles from software development, system administration, I've done a bit of uh, technical evangelism. I've done um, uh, support consulting services. Um, I've done technical sales um, and technical leadership before actually joining uh, the product world, uh, where I've been from a junior PM, mid-level PM, senior PM, and principal PM, and more recently a PM lead uh, in AKS. So uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the experiences that I've had. I have had the opportunity to lead teams uh, prior to Microsoft, in Microsoft, uh, product teams, non-product teams, in official capacity, non-official capacity, uh, and so that has given me um, a lot of opportunities to observe impact, to evaluate impact, and to really gain a lot of different perspectives um, about the differences from uh, measuring and evaluating impact outside of a PM role and inside of a PM role. And this, these are the perspectives that I hope to expect with you. I don't see this as a lecture. This is just really me having a conversation with you, and I hope that you can uh, use some of these perspectives uh, in your own teams, in your own career. Um, and I will be using knowledge from a lot of folks that are way smarter than me uh, and that I've also used and adapted to make sense of my teams and also the result of a lot of trial and error uh, from teams that I've been in or with uh, for things that have worked and not worked that well for us. So without further ado, uh, through our agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about why is it challenging to measure PM impact, uh, how you can actually evaluate it and measure it, how you should uh, possibly be communicating and rewarding it, and also how you can improve it. Now, the short answer there really is become a great PM and be the best PM you can be, and you'll typically will be having more impact. So we're not going to dive into that area. This is product school. It will help you break into PM and also make you a great PM. So you can just browse product school content and many, many talks and, and um, webinars and, and presentations and blogs out there on how to become a better PM. In here, I just want to do a brief um, overview from a lens specific of impact and how your impact is perceived and measured and how you can improve and optimize for that. So we're going to be focusing really much on that and not just the broader how to become better at PM. Now, starting with why is it a challenge to be um, to measure the impact of a PM? So the first thing is really the role. Uh, I mean, if I go to um, say my mom right now and say I'm gonna rejoin a band and uh, be a drummer in that band, I, I'm not sure how she would feel about that, but she'd probably have a very good idea of what I'll be doing next. Um, and I'm still trying to explain to her today, what is it that I do as a product manager? So it, it's a role that is fascinatingly unique. And although this meme of uh, being hard to explain what the the role is 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 becoming less and less prevalent. It, it is still true that it's it's hard to explain what this is. There's there's many presentations about just this specific thing and what the job entails and what it should entail and the tasks that it that it com uh, that comprise of, of of this role. So instead of going again too deep into it, uh, I'll probably use an analogy that I borrowed from a friend of mine, which is the analogy of the uh, underpants gnomes from South Park where they had this kind of three-phased approach um, master plan, which is like collecting all the underpants uh, in the world, phase one, phase two, question mark, and then phase three, profit, world domination. Um, and I think even though there's different schools of thought about what the PM really entails, I think most of them would agree with me if I just kind of split it out into there is some problem space, some ambiguity somewhere. Um, a PM comes in, rallies resources, um, from many different teams typically, um, from many different backgrounds, and together collectively will somehow transform that problem space and that ambiguity into business value. So typically that is so it's that phase two where kind of the magic happens. So, okay, so if this is fairly non-controversial, then did we just got to it? Is then business value it, a way to, to measure the PM impact? Well, yes. However, there are a few issues with business value. 
alone as the only thing that you look at when you uh, are measuring PM impact. Uh, the first thing to come to mind is the time horizon for that evaluation. Uh, if you're measuring your impact from like the value that you deliver to shareholders um, and that takes years, are you just going to evaluate that years in, in years basically? That's a little bit tricky. Um, and perhaps even more importantly is the attribution issue, which is how much of that value added to shareholders was because of you or that person individually when really the kind of job description that I put before is really collective with many, many individuals, again, driving from that problem space into business value. So how much of the PM, you know, how much would you attribute the PM to have changed that and to have contributed to that business value? So I found that to be a little bit flawed and challenging to just um, use business value alone and the role itself uh, with all its different uh, hats that sometimes it has to use makes it a little bit challenging to do. Moreover, discipline itself and the value of the PM discipline is still fairly up in the air. Once again, different schools of thought. I think more and more now we're in a golden age of PM or the teenage years of PM, however you prefer, uh, where more and more folks are breaking into PM, more and more PM roles are being um, open. And that's because more and more it's clear what happens uh, and, and the not so good outcomes of, that happen when PMs are not present. So you can see kind of that, that the whole um, when the PM is not there, but it's still somewhat hard to quantify the actual value of the discipline, the actual value of PM. As a PM, now we brought this to the company. It's, it's, it's still very, very hard to do that. And so once again, if we could do that very easily, um, well, then it would be much, uh, much easier to, to also quantify the impact and to pinpoint what impact individuals in that discipline would do. But that's not always easy. And then finally, the latter. Uh, this is not specific to PM, I would say, but once again, it's exponentially harder in PM because of the, the factors that I mentioned before. In any role, um, it will be a little bit more challenging to measure someone's impact based on the career stage that they're at. Uh, someone at the higher level, how do you actually measure that impact versus someone at a lower level? Um, but in PM, again, because all these things are so sometimes subjective um, and, and, and depend so much on so many factors, when you add up the ladder, career ladder on top, it becomes even harder to do that. I mean, if you're, uh, once again, the, that musician, maybe you know how to do a scale, maybe you know how to play a song or a full set, or now you know how to read music or compose or play by ear. You can kind of see almost a split that you could say, okay, these are the levels, uh, and this is a person that is in that level. And so to measure impact would be for that person to do that and to do that and do A, do B, um, and if you're doing A and B, then you're having impact. On the PM, that's not as easy as, as, as such. So what strategies can we do? And so my favorite uh, framework that I have been using um, over the last few years uh, and that have been working great for me um, is, is one that I heard the first from Shreya Dashi. Uh, I think this image is from 2020, but I think the first time I heard it was in 2019, uh, which is kind of the, the framework of input, output, and outcome. And the way that I kind of interpret it is I see the PM uh, role and me as a PM as kind of a system and where there are inputs, where it's basically um, your investigations, your, your market insights, your, uh, your PRDs, uh, your product requirement docs, your one pagers, the notes that you take and send out, the, uh, the communications that you send out, um, the decisions that you, that you take collectively, uh, all of those are inputs that you're putting into that system that will typically generate outputs, which could be features uh, the, or the feature velocity or um, improving quality of existing uh, parts of the product that maybe were causing um, issues and pain to customers and you just just improve that quality and that's a great output as well or even just maybe a feature existed maybe even has quality but um, it's a little bit rough on the edges uh, and so the users kind of struggle with that part of the product and you might just go and smooth that out iron out the, the edges there and and make the experience much easier that could for example uh, drive a much better outcome, which could, let's say, be an improved CSAT. Uh, so again, you improve that experience that was a little bit rough, um, that uh, uh, drove a improved CSAT of that part of the product, for example. So that's the outcome uh, that you had. And I see outcomes as not necessarily direct 
business value, as you can see. I mean, you proved seats of a part of a product hardly is business value directly. But it, it can be seen a little bit as a proxy metric for business uh, value, because if you have customers that are now happier with that part of the product, they'll probably retain more, churn less. Uh, they might be happier. They might spend more with your product. They might stay with your product longer. Uh, they might do good PR for you, which brings other customers. And now you start to see the increased revenue, the increased customer base, which drives to more, even more revenue. And now you can see how that was actually a leading indicator into the business value itself. And the great part about this is that you can actually measure them in much better periods than just taking years to manifest uh, on that business value. And you can still tie them to both on one hand, the business value, and on the other hand, the actions that PMs are taking uh, day in and day out. Um, the second thing that why I think this is great is that it's really uh, works across different stages and across the very different factors. Um, but you might ask now, okay, so it's, it's the, the case here now that we're gonna just do inputs plus outputs plus outcomes, and that's our impact, not as simple, so you need to strike some balance depending on uh, things like the PM career stage. If it's a junior PM or a senior PM, for example, the product stage, is it a early stage product or a very mature product? Uh, and things like organizations, uh, the, the types of industry, et cetera, they can all influence uh, this, um, th this equation. And it's gonna be typically not as linear as uh, just adding them up. You might need to have different weights for each one of them, depending on these factors. For example, um, in a product that is already very mature and you're focused on extracting value, so it's already past its growth phase and it's already a very mature product, you absolutely want to do a little bit more weight on the outcomes themselves than just the outputs and the inputs. Not zero, but you probably, in either of them, but you probably want to put a little bit more weight on the outcomes themselves. You want to be more outcome driven and you want to put more impact uh, and, uh, and measure better the outcomes than the outputs and, and inputs. Similarly, uh, or conversely in this case, uh, for an entry level PM, um, the impact that an entry level PM can have on outcomes is going to typically be much lower than what a senior PM can have uh, on outcomes. And so typically for an entry-level PM, uh, I'll I focus more on measuring uh, the PM's inputs. Again, the PRDs, the quality of the PRDs, quality of investigations, quality of the reports, uh, quality of note-taking. Um, and uh, then as the, as, the, as the PM stay more time in role and becomes more senior, the outputs, the feature velocity, the number of features, the quality that they're delivering with each feature and with the, their area of the product, uh, the improvements of, of, of key quality pieces of the product. Uh, and then obviously, as, as they continue that journey, give more to outcomes. But then for an entry level PM, inputs typically carry a little bit more weight than, than outputs and, and outcomes. And I might say, OK, so now we have this kind of equation um, and that might be easier, but what about uh, if someone is like mid-level but then has a very big scope, uh, how do you know exactly when you start to move these weights, right? When, when does, I, I told you as, as a PM goes, for example, in their career stage, you might move from giving a lot more weight to inputs to then moving into outputs and then maybe even later on to more into outcomes. But how do you decide that? How, when do you say this is the right time to change the weights, to change the equation? to uh, measure impact slightly different for this person. And so for that, I normally like to use kind of this ASH framework where um, if you take it from the top, it, it stands for kind of area of focus, solution, how and execution. So um, an area of focus, you have someone that is able to uh, actually define uh, an area of focus, a problem area, um, a strategy, a vision, if you will, someone that is defining a vision um, at just before that is someone that can just pick up a vision, a problem area, an area to focus on and start to drive solutions. Um, right after that, you have uh, the ability naturally that from a solution to understand how it can be implemented, how it can be done, and then you have actually executing and driving that to completion. So you can have as a vision, we're gonna be focusing on dinners uh, as then the solution for that, okay, so we're gonna need to have uh, dinner tables, dinner chairs, cutlery, all these things. All right, uh, the first thing we're gonna be doing is a dinner table. 
Um, you move on to the next stage. So, okay, so how do we assemble a dinner, a dinner table? I don't know how. Let me go and figure out how, how can we assemble a dinner table. And then finally, uh, uh, IKEA style, you get the instructions to assemble the dinner table and you get to execute on that um, uh, until completion and getting the dinner table there. And as you go up this, this ladder, uh, you're, you, you move from having instructions included into actually creating the instructions yourself into actually defining what is the thing that you're going to do um, and what is the, the, the thing you're going to do first and, and then to actually see what should be uh, the priority, what should be the vision for um, for this area, for this product, etc. And as you you might see from this plot, uh, you can actually plot yourself um, in, in any of these points and you'll notice that it is actually a little bit easier to go to to move laterally than it is to move vertically. And in particular, there is a big kind of <laughs> seemingly very high and very hard kind of a um, mountain to climb there at, at a particular stage. And that's when you're really starting to move from just execution and then when you are a bit more comfortable to even doing so without instructions or with less instructions into really going into defining what to do and, and what's important and what's the vision. And that part is really, really hard to climb. Um, so I, I got a lot of questions on like how do the PM impact stages kind of uh, map into that. Typically, once again, this is not linear, um, but typically they map a little bit like that. So you'll notice that uh, as you as you typically grow from an associate PM to PM role, you are now just instructions included, being able to execute. Um, as you move into PM2, you now start to have to be the one that uh, knows and defines the instructions. So you don't get instructions, uh, detailed instructions anymore, and you start to define those. And then as you move into the senior band, and now that you see the gap and you see the, the challenge there is you need to move into what are we going to do? What are the solutions uh, or the problems uh, that we need to do? What are even sometimes the problems for this area of focus, for this vision that we're trying to do? And then as a PM or a group PM or director, you're going to be doing uh, actually that vision definition, uh, that, that area of focus definition for the rest of the team. Um, and obviously, you'll notice that as we did that, we were actually growing in scope as well. So we were growing from just a feature to a feature group to a, a vertical or a product area to a product or even a set of products afterwards. And so uh, it will typically be almost easier to do that. But the challenge then happens when you start to grow on the Y axis a little bit more. So if you plot yourself in any of these positions uh, or somewhere close to this line, even if it's not exactly in this line, um, you'll be able to know exactly how your equation should look like. So obviously, if you're more in that execution uh, feature perspective, your inputs are going to be the, the most prominent and the, 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 the highest weight factor. If you're uh, conversely more in that solution and product area um, kind of region, then not normally you're, you're going to start to have a lot more outcome based. Uh, weights. So things are going to be more, uh, uh, the outcomes are going to weight more than, than the outputs. And if you're a little bit between maybe more than the how vertical area, for example, then you probably are really focused about having a, a lot of the outputs be your main thing. You, you're focused on feature velocity, on features, on quality of features, etc. And so this, this is a way to both see how you, you can measure folks differently based on their stages, based on their um, uh, place on the this ash framework and also what you might need to do in order to get to the next stage um, a little bit and this enters a bit into the next phase that i had uh, in this presentation which is the communication phase so you want to be as i was doing here now have a very transparent communication you want to know where someone is communicate that to them communicate the goals uh, that you that you uh, expect from them and that you're setting, uh, and you want to make sure that those are adequate to the career stage of that PM. And if you're a PM, you want to be have a very very crisp understanding of these. And if not, you, you'll want to ask. Um, thirdly, you you want to have predictable cycles of evaluation. So you you don't want to like, once again just casually one day come up and say, hey, we should talk about uh, evaluating your impact. No, it should be fairly predictable. The goal should be aligned to that cycle. Again, many companies have yearly, some companies have semester based, other companies have quarter, quarterly uh, evaluations. Whatever works for you, for your organization, for your team is, is good. 
but make it predictable, make it clear, communicate it well. And then on those times, also to take the time to reflect, reflect uh, not just measure the impact, but reflect where you are in that uh, framework, reflect where you are in terms of career stage, see what coaching opportunities you have for that person or that you as a PM uh, uh, feel that you need uh, and, and, and want to ask. And then for ways to, to grow that impact and to reward uh, and to further reward impact, make sure to be providing opportunities for that growth. Um, be it again a way to grow laterally or a grow to or a way to grow vertically uh, on that framework, so that folks can increase their impact and be re rewarded accordingly for that impact increase. All right. So the last piece that we have really is all about how can we improve RPM impact. Now, once again, the key thing here is improve your PM senses. Uh, be, uh, have a better execution sense, have a better analytical sense, uh, and have a better product sense. And if you keep improving your product senses, you typically will be uh, improving your PM impact. Now, a common um, misconception or myth that I hear a lot is focus solely on your strengths and let your weaknesses be. Just be the best you can be on the things that you're good at. Um, as a PM, I don't necessarily agree with this. I think that's a generic good advice to say you should boost your strengths as much as you can. But as a PM, you really don't want to have your weaknesses pull you down. Uh, so you want to at least get your weaknesses to a baseline that is acceptable. Think of the framework input output outcome or into any of those uh, uh, areas of the ASH framework and think uh, if any of those areas is a zero. So if, if you're giving yourself a one to three, right? Like you, you're really good at maybe defining solutions, but you're terrible at executing. You're a zero. You're like a three in um, defining solutions, but you're a zero in executing. So that's your ceiling. So now you, you can't really get anything done because even though you might come up with great solutions, you, you actually are not able to execute them and have them follow through. So you, you, you don't want to have... Uh, to be at in that stage because that zero will cancel out everything. It's like a multiplication, right? If you multiply anything for, for by zero, you're going to get zero. So you want to have at least a baseline that doesn't hurt you uh, and doesn't hurt your career and doesn't hurt your impact. And so that's why I normally disagree on just focusing on your strengths. Make sure that your weaknesses are at an acceptable level and then absolutely make sure to maximize your strengths. Be the best you can be, be a three in, in, uh, in uh, for example, um, solution definition or vision definition, whatever it is that you might be good, uh, but then be at least a one in um, or a two or whatever it might be in execution and in, in analysis and in, in creating that, those instructions, et cetera. Otherwise, what can often happen um, is something like uh, your quality ex of execution could be awesome, but because you're so focused on execution, removing blockers and getting things done and pushing that thing to, to release and uh, going and compromising and, and, and reducing scope and changing scope and aligning stakeholders and finally you get it done. And in fact, that idea doesn't even solve the problem anymore. So you, once again, you want to make sure that you sometimes step back and use all your product senses. Uh, like if, if you're great at execution, you need to make sure that you're deliberately uh, stepping back sometimes and using your product senses. See, am I even solving the problem anymore? Is this idea even solving these? And, and as you see, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's only one right quadrant in this chart. The rest are all unsuccessful. Now, the next thing that you want to do is make sure that you prioritize. And now you're like, OK, uh, prioritize the, I mean, I'm a PM. But you will notice a little, uh, an interesting thing, which is very often uh, you will have, you'll be good on that Y and X, and X axis. But so you'll have, be doing a good quality of execution and you'll be doing an idea that does solve the problem, but sometimes you'll be missing is that even the problem you should be solving um, now as a pm you might be saying okay but i'm a pm i know how to prioritize but really uh it's not just about prioritizing the features and the problems that you need to solve it's about then following through for example i it is countless the amount of times that i found pms that do a great job at saying these are the two most important features that we have and then the other two are really um P2s are really uh, secondary. These two are definitely the most important ones, the ones that I prioritize the highest. And then they get at the end of, the, of a period and they got maybe one of those 
and then the other two less important ones, or maybe none of the important ones, and then they got the other two less important ones. And then there's all kinds of reasons for that. Oh, because the other two, I mean, I, I, I attack all four the same, but then those two were easier, so the engineering team got, got to them and did them, and these two were so much harder, so uh, they required a lot more uh, effort from me, uh, and I was so busy and I had so many meetings and so so many other things that, that I, I just couldn't get to them. So yeah, they're still more important, but they just, just didn't happen. What that tells me is that you prioritize potentially the right features, but prioritize your time and your actions wrong. So when I say prioritize here, it's not just about uh, those charts that I showed you and about knowing what to do and how to do it. And that is it, solve, is it solving the problem? Is it the right problem to solve? But it's also, are you yourself prioritizing your time, your actions, your calendar accordingly to make sure that the two things you said are important are the two things that you are effectively working. Because if you said they're important, ideally they're going to be the ones that are going to have the biggest uh, influence on your impact. If you miss them, then the, con the reverse happens, right? And you're going to have the least uh, um, impact possible because you didn't meet them. And then more often than not, um, the case is a little bit more nuanced where you might have two very important features and then maybe eight others that are less important and at the end of the semester at the end of the semester or the quarter or whatever you might have i don't know maybe i have done three one very important uh, and two or three less important so hey four it's really bad it was really good right um or maybe i did even six i did six five less important one very important and I just, yeah, I couldn't get to that one super other important one. But hey, six, it's it's more than half of all the features out there. It has to be a good impact, right? Well, potentially. But what if you had done only four, but you had included the two most important ones? Now that probably would, those four are probably more valuable than the six that you did, right? So it's really all about making sure that you have quality versus quantity. And you have that really, really ingrained in your brain that you're optimizing for impact and not for quantity. And similarly, that you are prioritizing doing things with quality. Once again, you don't want any zeros. So you did all 10 features, great, but you did them at 20% quality. Then you actually did zero features because a feature without quality is almost the same as no feature at all. So this is really important to kind of understand this dichotomy and, and prioritize accordingly in this dichotomy. The next thing is horizontals. And this is great for both getting opportunities across different things to expand your scope, as well as opportunities to work on things that you might traditionally not have uh, a lot of exposure to. It's great to give you visibility. It's great to, to, to get you uh, to work with different parts of the team because horizontals are typically those cross team processes that you can help improve or create from scratch, uh, those cross-team initiatives that you can lead. So you have all kinds of opportunities, even if you're like a junior PM, um, uh, leading a horizontal will actually allow you to work across the whole ASH framework. Because a lot of times you'll be, okay, for this horizontal, what exactly is going to be our strategy here? What exactly uh, are we going to do? And how are we going to do it? So you, you'll get in charge of that in a, in a case where it's not directly necessarily linked to the product uh, right away, but it will allow you to actually have an impact that is across the team. Um, and it will also allow you to grow on that framework and to grow on that and to plot yourself probably a little bit higher in, in that chart, which again, will move the needle of the, your equation and move the, your impact as well. Uh, the next one might be a little bit controversial, but uh, it's about acknowledging op optics and visibility, which is sometimes, again, maybe you did those two features uh, that were super important that we discussed before, but you didn't really communicate them. Uh, and so from everybody's perspective, you did zero features uh, because two features that you didn't communicate, uh, that you didn't uh, brought out, are they even there? Is like a tree fall into the forest? Did, did any tree actually fall? So it, it's about the same thing. It's not necessarily bad. Sometimes optics are, are seen as, as a very, very, very bad thing. And sometimes they are, that's true. But uh, there's a baseline of communication and visibility that you need to ensure so that your impact is, is perceived in the same way that you're perceiving it. So always ensure that other folks are perceiving your impact the same way and be open to the fact that the way that you are perceiving your impact is not correct. Because again, your leader or um, leaders uh, uh, up the chain might be 
focusing more on uh, the output or the outcome and you might be very focused on the input and then there's a, a mis kind of communication on actually how much impact you're having. So make sure once again that you communicate well with both your reports as well as your leaders into how exactly your impact is being measured um, so that there's no miscommunication and then make sure to communicate and give visibility to what you're doing accurately. Again, don't over communicate, don't spam. So uh, uh, work on an agreement with your leaders and your reports on what's the best way to communicate. Now coaching again, I put coaching twice on both how to uh, reward and to increase someone else's impact as well as how to improve your own PM impact. If you think you need coaching on something, ask. Ask, ask your leaders, ask your teammates, ask your mentors. And on the flip side, as a leader, make sure you're coaching folks on how to increase their impact. If they're doing a great job, but once again, they're hyper-focused on one of those areas and they're really leaving the other ones down. And then basically, at the end of the day, the impact is being completely thwarted coach them, make sure that they know about that and that they can act upon it. Uh, and then make sure to leave. As a PM and as uh, across my teams, I, I want to uh, always to make the point that all the product managers are leaders. It don't mean that they're the bosses of anyone, the managers of anyone, they don't necessarily own something, but uh, they are, the to me, the truest uh, definition of a leader, which is they set the example and do the right things, um, regardless of if anyone is watching or seeing. And if they do that and continue to do that, eventually people will follow them. And so that is super, super important because you want to be doing always the right things um, and you want to be setting a good example. And that is the best way as well to improve your impact uh, and to improve your different PM senses and to also move both laterally and vertically in that plot. And finally, understand the expectations of your current stage and next stages. How can you move to the next stage? How can you move to the next vertical ladder or to the next horizontal ladder uh, in, the, in that chart? What is required for that next stage? Am I meeting all the expectations for the current stage? Understand those, know those very, very, very deeply because once again, the equation to uh, measure and evaluate your impact will depend on it. All right, that is all from me. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this time or thank you very much for uh, your attention today and for spending this time with me. I hope this was helpful and it got you to reflect on PM Impact a little bit more and maybe even give you some tips and strategies on how to uh, measure it for uh, your teams or how to look at uh, your own PM Impact and how to maybe even improve it into the future. Thank you very much. Have the rest of a good day.